first met Sam, my life was really chaotic and I had no like, sense of stability. I'd lost everything that made my life my life. So he seemed like my stability. While I was with Sam, he slapped me, he punched me, he stamped on me repeatedly, he spat on me, spat in my face. He put my arms under my body and sat on top of me so I couldn't defend myself and punched me all in my, all in my rib cage and in my belly and in, in my ears, that really hurt. He strangled me once to the point that I, I passed out. He threatened me with knife, threatened me with scissors, threatened me with meat cleaver, threatened to shoot me in the fence, threatened to break my nan's legs. He rained terror on me for months. I felt like no one could defeat him. I felt like he was bigger than everybody else and he would outsmart everyone else because he used to tell me all the time I was stupid and I was dumb and I was thick. So I started to believe that I was really stupid and thick and I just felt like nobody could take him down because he used to say things like, well, if you did snitch on me, he's like, who are they going to believe? Like you and me, like, look at you, you've got nothing, you know, you've lost everything, I've, you know, and if it wasn't for me, you'd have nothing. That's what he used to say. Sam had a really good head start in separating me from my friends and family because of the situation I was in. So I was already in like a refuge. I was three and a half, four hours away from everything that I knew. So I was really quite, quite isolated. Even if my mum texted me and said, how are you? He would say, what, why was she asking how you are? What have you told her and things like that? And he used to do that, but with all of my friends. So slowly I just cut them all off. There was one time that he beat me up so badly, um, the next day I thought he'd broken one of my bones. So I went to the GPs just to get pa like pain relief and for her to just check me over. But the, the GP said that my injuries were too bad to be dealt with in the surgery, so I had to go to the hospital to have x-rays. I wasn't supposed to have left the house but I knew that I needed to get help. I knew I, like, there was something really wrong with my arm. Like, um, So I, I, risked, I risked it for a chocolate biscuit. I thought, I'll just go there. I'll just, I just need to get some help. But I didn't go there to try and expose him. The hospital, like, obviously, they were suspicious of my injuries. And I spoke to somebody who was really lovely in there. And I thought it was all confidential, um, but she had a duty of care safeguarding, I think, and she reported it to the police and he was arrested for, for that incident. Um, and as soon as he, like, was arrested, I felt so guilty, like, I felt like I was ruining both of our lives and any life that I had left because now he was being taken away by the police and I, can, I felt like I wouldn't cope on my own. Um, and then I lied to the police. I told the police that I'd fallen down the stairs, tripped over the dogs, fallen down the stairs. So he, although the police knew that he was lying, and they knew that I was lying, they had to release him. I worried that if I did speak to the police and he was arrested, that when they, he was let out, that he'd come back and do twice as worse to me, or kill me for being a grass, or like being a snitch. Um, so I was frightened to talk to the police. I used to make plans in my head how I was going to escape, but in the end I, I had to be saved by the police. I was the officer in charge of Sophie's case. The first time I saw her she looked drained, um, tired, her hair, everything about her just looked like it had had enough. Um, she looked like she'd got no spirit inside her. 
Sophie didn't want to report to the police and she didn't actually make that call. It was done by an independent person who had reported the incident. She met a detective the next day who said to her that he felt that if she didn't engage, the next time we would be called to the address, we'd be going there for a body, not a person. When he asked me to marry him, he did promise me that he would stop hurting me. But actually, he, he just got worse. He said, I'm worried that one day I'm going to kill you. But if I do kill you, we'll always be together because if you're dead, then my life isn't worth living. So I'll kill myself so we can always be together forever. And it's at that point that I felt like that any boundary that he had, he just literally, with those words, just lifted it off so he could do whatever he wanted. Because ultimately, if I did die, He's got a plan of action um, and he knows exactly what he's going to do if I did die. And I, I was absolutely convinced that he would do what he said he would do. I was absolutely terrified. Absolutely terrified of him. He used to say things like, nobody will even notice that you're gone. And I used to believe him. I used to think, because I was so closed off from people that I knew and my friends and my family. I did fully believe that if he murdered me, it would take a long time before anyone even noticed. I felt at that point that um, I was good as dead and that one day he would kill me. Coming through the process on, on the other side, she's got like a glow, like it's like a new lease of life. I can't say that I've seen her over the last three months where she hasn't had a smile on her face and I don't feel like the person I met in the refuge is the person that I see now. I feel like she's got it right, we've got it right, the courts have got it right um, in the sense of being proud of her for coming forward and going through that process. and the times where she probably thought there wasn't anyone and thinking, oh, I haven't heard from the police, I don't know what's going on, she still kind of got through it. Um, yeah, so I'm really proud of, of what she's done. Every case of domestic violence, like every situation is very different, but the one thing that remains the same in every single case is the abuser. Like and they all have follow similar traits. I didn't even realise this until months after he was in prison. And I understand from actual experience how hard it is to actually leave someone because by the time you want to leave because you're so frightened, it might have escalated so much to the point where, you know, I tried to get out one day and I was pulled back in and beaten up and stamped on and spat on because I tried to leave. the evidence that got used in court was evidence off my phone and I took a couple of photos of a few injuries, not, not, not all of them, just a few, and they were exchanged between me and my mum, but not in the capacity of documenting anything, just saying, mum, look at this bruise, it's, it's like fading, you know, it's fading, but I've got a, a doctor's appointment, can you suggest, how can I make it look better? So. All of that was deleted between my, me and my mum and the police recovered everything that I deleted off my phone for months to protect him. Wait till they've gone out or, or you're in a safe place. So even if it's a locked toilet, it, you know, like if you're in Sainsbury's, you're out food shopping, I don't know, say like you need the toilet so you can get into the women's toilets and just ring for help or, or stay in that toilet. Like if you're frightened to go home with them, stay in a public place, like prolong your stay. That's what I used to try and do is prolong my stay. I should have prolonged and then told someone and then got help. But I was, I was getting there. I knew I needed to get like help. It just took me a long time and I was just lucky that other people called the police for me. 
whether you're a next door neighbour, someone walking past and walking the dog or uh, someone just in the vicinity and you hear or see or know of someone who's in domestic abuse situation, domestic violence situation, it's best to call the police because then we can start our safeguarding approach even if it's completing a risk assessment where nothing's, no criminal offences have been disclosed, it's then on our system that we have been to that address and we can start looking at patterns of calls and behaviour. Um, and that would be my advice of potentially someone ringing up um, and reporting it anonymously could save that victim's life. I never rung the police, the police were always wrong for me, but in the end I chose to work with the police because if I didn't, I probably wouldn't be sat here now. Thank you.